Today we're speaking with Dr. Laura Esserman, Director of the Carol Frank Breast Care Center and Professor of Surgery and Radiology at the University of California, San Francisco. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Esserman. You're very welcome. At SABCS, you moderated a session about symptom management. Would you discuss how this relates to your philosophy about treating patients holistically and encouraging them to become involved in the decision-making process? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I asked uh, uh, several people to come in and talk to us about matters about, about the things that really matter to patients. Uh, and, and I think it's so important for clinicians to understand that there's a consequence to everything we do. And at the time you're making a decision about treatment, people are usually frightened. And the only thing they can think about is, I want to survive. And fear drives a lot of treatment decisions that may not be appropriate for their situation. But the truth of the matter is, when the fear dissipates and you live with the day-to-day -day consequences of very real side effects, you, that, that persists and that is a big deal. And what we learned last night was you know, maybe only 20% of people who have very significant symptoms even talk to their physicians about it. So it's important to me that physicians be very, very aware that every intervention they do has the potential for long-term consequences that do affect people day to day. We have learned a lot about biology, so we can start to learn how to do less more safely. The best way to avoid side effects is to avoid the treatment if people don't need it. So I think it's really important to stop, let people get grounded in what's really going on if they have a low-risk tumor, to make sure that you give time for that fear to subside so they can make rational decisions and engage in saying, gee, how risk averse am I? Is this gonna really help me sleep at night or now that I feel reassured, do I feel safer going with maybe a treatment that has you know, less intervention and feels just as safe? When people are panicked, they don't make good decisions. So allowing people to stop, get grounded, get educated, and helping them understand that they have time to make a good decision does the first and most important step of making you do a better job of tailoring the treatment to the situation at hand, both their personal situation and the biology of the tumor that you face. I think it's also really important to recognize that there are many things that people are studying that can make a big difference. Our first speaker who talked about ways to prevent lymphedema showed fantastic data, data that's just coming out in JAMA. Not only can exercise or a rehab approach to arm motion reduce chronic, you know, problems with chronic lymphedema, but can avoid the symptoms altogether. This is pretty meaningful, things that affect people in a very real day-to-day -day life. Uh, so is this standard of care? Unfortunately, she said she had no conflicts of interest because no one's interested in funding exercise studies. But we have to be committed as clinicians to making sure we do the things that patients really care about, avoiding side effects of treatment, asking people about pain, making sure that we're educated and know how to offer people respite from pain, knowing which botanicals are worth investing in and helping people get into trials that make sense. And finally, very exciting is the opportunity to reduce hair loss. So maybe chemotherapy can be given without people having to lose their hair. And the way I look at it is that is one of the most dreaded side effects of chemotherapy. It matters to our patients. It should matter to us. It looks like there's essentially no risk to trying these things. We should be testing them, pushing them into the clinic, and getting people the things that they need that make the treatment less of a burden. Would you discuss how we should be thinking about mammography today? Uh, sure. You know, mammography is a very complicated subject and it's created great controversy. But I think what's important for us to do is to think about mammography, not as whether it's good or bad, but to really say, what are the contributions mammography can make? But what are the limitations? What can it not do? We can't expect it to do things that it cannot it do. It is not going to cure breast cancer. We are not going to prevent breast cancer with mammography. So we have to also ask ourselves, how can we move on? and not get stuck in an endless debate over this issue. The truth of the matter is we've learned a lot about the biology of breast cancer. And much of that understanding really helps us understand why the US Preventive Task Force guidelines make so much sense. For our fastest growing high-risk cancers, screening is very unlikely to make a difference. 
because number one, the biology is bad even if it's small and we're gonna treat it so. So you don't avoid treatment by early detection and you don't necessarily avoid a bad outcome by early detection. You have to get the systemic treatment right. Those are more often in young women and more often show up between screens. So you have to get the message to women. If you have a mass, even if you've had a normal mammogram, make sure you go in and talk to your physician about it. That's an important message. On the other hand, as you get older, we understand that you're more likely to develop indolent cancers or slower growing cancers. And the more you screen, the more you look, no question we're gonna surface more cancers. That's what the data show us. And in fact, we do find more low risk cancers and more ultra low risk cancers as screening. So the kinds of cancers you detect with screening are different from the cancers that grow in between. So what that tells us is as you get older and you're much more likely, like over 70, to get these low risk cancers, Screening's not going to help you. You don't need it. That's How great is that? So you don't have to do it. And for the cancers that matter most, probably every other year is, is, is just as good. For the cancers where screening really works, cervical cancer, colon cancer, these are slower growing tumors. So every other year, just like the modeling has showed, and the data show is probably just sufficient. And by the way, in Europe, nobody screens every, every year. And this is like billions of dollars. So if you can use that money more wisely, why not? Are there other things we can do? Absolutely. What about routine risk assessment? There's level one evidence that you can prevent breast cancer with tamoxifen, raloxifene. Where is our effort to systematically do risk cancer assessment like we do for cardiac risk assessment? Find the people at the highest risk and counsel them about prevention. Why aren't we doing that? We'll make more difference that way. Why aren't we looking for people who are mutation carriers, who really have an 85% lifetime risk, and counseling them? They may not be very common, but those are the people we can do things about. Again, very important message for the public. There are things you can do. Know your risk factors, know your body. Know if you come from a family full of breast and ovarian cancer. Talk to your doctor about it. Lifestyle, reducing your, your body mass index, you know, getting fit and healthy. Everyone says it's good for you, but by the way, it reduces breast cancer risk. It's not going to be the end all be all, but it's again something you can do and that's important. The third thing is, you know, to make sure that if you are, uh, that if you are uh, making a decision about screening or if you're recalled for a biopsy, you have a choice. You have a choice and you can discuss options with, with a physician. So we often recall people for, to get a biopsy for very, very low risk risk of maybe in situ disease only, 3%, 5%. That's not an emergency. It's not even serious. Wait to see if something develops. We need to start testing and developing new interventions. And I have to say, we also have to take on the very serious challenge of in situ disease. I think the majority of what we're detecting is probably high risk lesions, and we have to stop treating it as cancer. We have to start testing new approaches so that we reduce the burden of cancer diagnosis. And we have to know that if you're going to screen, you are going to surface more indolent cancer. And being able to classify that at the time of diagnosis will allow us to test less interventions, again, reducing the burden of cancer diagnosis and treatment. If you can avoid treatments that don't make a difference, how great is that? So my challenge to the scientific community to work with the clinicians to redefine what is cancer. This is a common problem for all screening, right? That you find things that look like our traditional definition of cancer, but in fact are not uh, uh, inexorably lethal. In that sense, we then have to say, let's get a new definition of cancer. Let's get some new biomarkers to test this, validate that. We would make a huge difference uh, in, 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 in avoiding pain and suffering just on that basis alone. In order oh, and what, actually one last thing. I think that everyone who's diagnosed with a cancer needs to know they have time to learn about their situation, understand what their options are, ask about whether they can participate in a clinical trial. There are trial websites that women can go to, breastcancertrials.org, will help you find a trial that's right for you. Everyone should know that that's an option. In order to better understand who is at risk for what kind of cancer and then develop the appropriate screening tools, you're spearheading a tracking system called the Athena Breast Health, Health Network. 
Uh, can you tell us about that, please? I can. So a lot of these big things that I talked about, how do we move beyond screening, how do we make it better, it's not something you can do with a 50-person study or a 100-person study. It requires a big collaborative effort. At the University of California, all five UC medical centers have gotten together and decided they want to spearhead this initiative called the Athena Breast Health Network. And we are going to do these things. We are going to have a systematic uh, approach to all the women in our network and we'll increase uh, our pool uh, through affiliates and probably track well over 200,000 women. And what we want to do is we want to automate risk assessment. We want to identify people, automate the identification of people at the highest risk and offer them prevention counseling with health coaches. You know, we want to offer them options for reducing their biopsy rates and test some of these new ideas and find out whether we can safely do less. We're going to profile every patient who comes in with a tumor and we're going to start to understand who's at risk for what kind of cancer. For those cancers where screening isn't helping us, maybe we'll do a better job of trying to understand what the etiology is so we can get tailored or targeted prevention. The truth of the matter is we now know in the treatment realm that breast cancer is not the same. We should not be approaching prevention and screening as the same. So in this big concerted effort, it's a really, it's a, it's a, a learning system for healthcare delivery where we're going to blur the distinction between research and care because truly, we all need the same data. We all need to learn as we go. And you know, I'm a clinician, I take care of people. My patients don't have 10 years to wait for us to get our act together or 20 years to figure it out. We need to work harder, faster, and smarter, and we need to develop systems that allow us to take new ideas and implement them the next day. I'm going to go home and put the, uh, you know, the, the prevention of lymphedema through, through physical therapy through, through a physical therapy program, we could do that tomorrow. When you're ready to implement it, why are we taking three years to disseminate data? So we want to have a system that allows us to do that, that's really based on modern technology and, and allows us to, to learn how other systems and other, other industries have, have, have revolutionized what they do. So we're very excited about it. We think that's the way to start figuring out how to make a big dent in breast cancer. You lead the iSpy trials, which are aimed at matching treatments to patients based on biomarkers and speeding new drug development. Could you discuss the status of iSpy? I can. So uh, we developed iSpy because for those patients that we said have the highest risk tumors, they're the people most at risk to die. And if we don't get the systemic therapy right, they aren't going to do anywhere near as well. But if we do, then they have a much better chance of surviving long term. Again, we want to get the right drug to the right patient at the right time, and we want to do it now. And the old way of doing it, when someone comes in and you operate on them, and then you give them a new therapy, you know, by the time those drugs get to market, it's 10 to 20 years that to, to learn before a drug comes in. It takes 10 years and a billion dollars to get a new drug on the market. That doesn't serve anybody. Certainly doesn't serve the patients, doesn't serve industry, and it doesn't serve our physician academic community. We need tools and a system to learn as you go. Again, adaptive design, neoadjuvant setting, learning now. I'm a surgeon, okay? I know that if someone comes in with a tumor that's at risk to spread to other organs, operating on them is not going to save their life. Getting the treatment right will. So we want to start with that chemotherapy and learn whether the tumor shrinks. But what we've allowed the industry to do is say, hey, we're going to test your new phase two drugs now right now, up front. Learn early which of these drugs in the pipeline is going to work. There are a hundred drugs in the pipeline. If it takes us one at a time every 10 years, that's opportunity cost. If stuff doesn't work, move on. Let's get the next one in. Let's figure it out. And because we're going to profile every patient, we're going to be able to figure out which ones work for each patient. The whole idea of iSpy2 is to say, can we find the right drug and biomarker pair to move forward to test in the bigger, more definitive trial. That's the idea, to do it fast. So uh, we actually opened the trial uh, this spring. I have to say that we're actually uh, accruing patients ahead of schedule. We just opened up our 18th site. We're going to open up 20 sites total. I'm incredibly excited about it. Patients are excited about it. The phys physicians are excited about it. I, I think I think what makes it so exciting actually is that it truly is a collaborative effort. It is really 
a pre what we call a pre-competitive collaborative situation. So everyone's investing in a big network and a big trial, and that infrastructure is serving everybody. So it's a tenth the cost, and all the data is eventually going to go back to the whole to the whole network. And you know we have uh, four drugs lined up now that we're testing, and hopefully about eight more in the pipeline. And you know we hope that you know this is. No, not the end all be all. You know, I hope in a couple of years we'll be on to the next one, I Spy 3. But, you know, I think that the answer is we cannot sit back and be content to do things at the pace we've been doing it. We've got this explosion of information in science. Our, our, our clinical paradigms have to keep pace and we have to innovate. We have to innovate the way we do trials, we have to innovate our regulatory science. And when we show that things work, we have to move it forward and we have to be committed. It, developing those systems that allow us to rapidly learn and advance the field. And the reason we have to do that is because our patients are suffering. So if you solve it for them, you solve it for everyone. It's good for everyone. It's a total win-win. So we're very excited to be part of it. Oh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Asterman. You're very welcome.